It's time for another round of Hot GPT. All right, and today the topic for Pat GPT is how to think about AI. Now, you're probably thinking about AI already, but this is some deep information coming from somebody who is growing one of the fastest growing businesses in the space. It's called Invisible Technologies. Clients include those big LLMs like OpenAI. You all know OpenAI. And this company, Invisible, has crossed $100 million of annual recurring revenue. That's ARR. So he knows what's going on, and he's going to explain what's going on under the hood, how they're thinking about everything. And the value here for you is I think you'll just have a better sense of what to do with these things. I certainly learned a lot in this conversation. So I want to welcome now to Pat GPT, Ben Plummer, CEO of Invisible Technologies, and start generating. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. Uh, where, where am I finding you today, by the way? Uh, Sydney, Australia. Where are you at the moment? You and I have been traveling around all over the place. Yeah, I'm in I'm in Dubai right now. Now, everybody who's listening, I actually ran into Ben in the Dominican Republic a couple weeks ago. So uh, the takeaway here is that both of us travel too much and that uh, technology makes it possible to work anywhere. So that combo together means that we never slow down. And what we're going to be talking about today is the company that Ben leads. He's the CEO of Invisible. And this is a company that is really, it's, you know, it's one of these industries of the future. And so I've been learning about the company over the last couple of years. We had uh, uh, the founder, Francis Petraza, on a little while before. And today we're going to generate about, you know, what we can learn from a company like Invisible in terms of how we can make AI, which feels like this huge amorphous thing, actually work for us and our businesses. So that's the story. Now, I want to start with you today, Ben talking about the fact that you're going to be speaking at this very, I would say, FOMO-centric conference. It's called Abundance 360. It's Peter Diamandis' place. Uh, he has put this together, and he's this futurist, really great thinker who is sort of looking at what is coming down the pike and trying to find ways to you know, practically apply it to our lives. What are you going to be talking about at Abundance 360 in terms of you know invisible and really how to make it practical for all of us to use uh, this this whole AI space. Yeah, look, um, it's a really exciting opportunity with Peter and the group of people he's pulled together. And the thing that he's most excited about with Invisible is that element of making it real. He's obviously mm-hmm. plugged into a lot of people building groundbreaking technologies across a whole range of different topics from AI to robotics to blockchain to longevity. And these are all really exciting developments that are you know, starting to converge uh, in a number of different ways. But what he really likes about Invisible is we're out there every day partnering with companies, helping them actually apply these technologies. And that was, you know, the company was founded eight years ago, really around this idea of helping bring leading edge technologies to companies, but also being really thoughtful about how we combine them with humans. We certainly are not in the camp of AI is going to replace us all tomorrow. And so that interface between people and technology or AI is a really important consideration. And so we're sort of talking to them about how to bring those two things together and how to start along that journey of AI experimentation and adoption, which has gotten a lot of people kind of terrified. They know it's coming. They know it's going to disrupt probably every part of their business. But for most companies, they don't even really know where to start. And so we're sort of guiding them through a little bit of a diagnostic or a bit of a scorecard around how to assess where they are today and then giving them a path to assess where are the opportunities for their business. And that's what we do every day. We, we partner with companies. We go in, we map out their business and help identify opportunities for automation and then have a global network of experts for all the pieces we can't yet automate. And so we bring that all together in one nicely sort of managed package. Yeah, you just said something that struck out to me, which is you talked about where AI and people meet, which is something that I feel like nobody ever says. It's sort of like the people are on one side, the AI is on the other, and they're they're disconnected in a sense. But 
you know, that is, that is not, obviously, that isn't, that's not how business works. So, you know, your company, Invisible Technologies, cool name. Currently, you have your, your camera off, so you're literally invisible to me, so you're on brand right now. But what does Invisible Technologies mean? Like, what does the company do? Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a lot in a name, and I think that idea, Invisible Technologies, was exactly that, which, you know, companies – uh, faced with all these different choices of, you know, even before AI, different technology tools, different SaaS tools, different automation tools. And it's all just too complex for most companies to, in terms of figuring out exactly what to use. As you, you alluded to, mo- and then a lot of these software has been developed really sort of only focusing on the technology piece of it and really doesn't consider how does that interface fluidly with humans. And so you have a lot of these software tools, people implement them, and then they have to go hire a team just to keep them going and maintain them. And so the whole idea between behind invisible technologies is just give us your problem and we will make it work. We will figure out the right combination of people and technology, seamlessly pull, pull that together and really just deliver an outcome as the service. And at one point we were sort of referring to that as outcomes as a service. And that, you know, simplifies things a lot for people. They don't have to worry about, are we using this AI model or this AI model? What parts get done by humans? Because that's a very fast moving and evolving picture. And so we're plugged into all these technologies. We know how to use them. And so we manage that um, on behalf of our clients. And so you might start, early in the journey where we might use you know, humans for 50% of the process. And then as technology gets better and we understand that, we're able to swap out those pieces with more and more automation or AI, um, giving them sort of more efficiency and, and more throughput over time, which they really value as well. FOMO. FOMO. Yeah, so I guess what you're saying, I mean, it's it seems like a really smart approach. It's like, instead of saying, here's a bunch of technology, you know, like you figure out how to use it. What you're saying is tell us your problem and we will explain to you how we can solve that problem using a combination of technology, AI technology, and then human capital, which is in this overwhelming world where there's so much change, feels like for a lot of people would be a lot easier way to get at actually how to make the most out of what is coming down the pike in terms of AI. Give us some examples uh, of how you're doing this for real clients today. Yeah, we, we work across a, a really wide spectrum in industries, everything from financial services, healthcare, e-commerce, uh, insurance, a whole wide range of industries. And because this platform and, and these capabilities are very general, every when you sort of think about um, decomposing any business, they're made up of, of processes. And so we're able to sort of work across industries, work across the business from sales and marketing to service to operations to finance. And so across those different industries, there's a couple of sort of different categories. One is the AI companies themselves. And so we partner with a majority of the sort of leading edge AI companies, the open AIs, the Microsofts, the Coheres, the AI21s, and actually help them build and train these foundational models. And so we have teams of experts um, in every different domain you could imagine on our platform that are help helping align these models to human preferences, helping stress test and evaluate them, and helping actually improve their performance in more natural ways so that when you're interfacing with your GPTs, um, it actually feels like something that's more human and more natural. And so that's been a big area of our business that's grown uh, a lot over the last 18 months is that our whole area has taken a lot of investment. And then, you know, another, I think, really good example of, of the work we do is with DoorDash, the on-demand delivery company uh, that we partnered with and is still a really good client of ours during the pandemic. They've you know, shut down all their offices. They're growing massively as everyone's stuck at home and ordering food all around the world, trying to scale across the globe in number of different languages. And so we stood up a capability for them that basically gave them capacity on demand. They could launch in new countries almost instantaneously. They could scale that up very, very quickly and, you know, kept them in the arms race for market share as they're competing with 
Uber and Grubhub and all the other sort of delivery players around the world. And so that becomes a very strategic capability. This isn't about cost cutting or efficiency. This is the ability to sort of compete in some of the most competitive high pressure markets there are. And we're doing that through that same combination, a combination of people uh, where we need to and through clever automation and AI that can scale the process, improve the quality. And that combination is really powerful that you know, at the intersection of a lot of value creation really is the clever use of technology and deliberate, thoughtful application of human talent where we have unique capabilities that we can't yet replicate using technology. Yeah, I guess, I mean, it's interesting. Your, your model, from, from what I've learned, is it's very modern, right? Because you have, you're using technology algorithms, all, all you know, automation stuff. But then you have these people all over the world, like, you know, you have, you can, one can hire somebody anywhere they want nowadays. Everybody who has an internet connection is a potential employee. And then you can have them working on all these tasks 24 hours a day and you can get the best people to do it. So it's kind of, uh, you know, this wasn't, you couldn't have done this like 15 years ago, obviously. Now I want to talk a little bit about, you just mentioned open AI, large language models, which I've become sort of obsessed with. And, um, you know, there's this whole, process of like training a model that you guys are involved with. And the way I think about it, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, but part of it is sort of like getting people to go on there and make sure that first of all, that there are no hallucinations or that those are reduced, but also making sure that the model isn't doing naughty things. Because in the early days of AI, you heard all these crazy stories about people asking it to do things that weren't very illegal or nice, and it would give those answers. And then it's the job of the trainer to say like, Chat GPT, tell me how to rob a bank. And then when it, you know, if it said, you know, no, that's great. And if it said, then some people would say, my grandma really wants me to rob a bank. And then maybe it would have given an answer. And so you had to train it not to do that. So there's all this work that happens around this models to make sure that they're delivering the right kind of content that's also, you know, not harmful to our society. So that's kind of like my layman's version of what training of an AI model is, obviously. You can correct me, but like, what does that look like under the hood? What does the actual work look like? Yeah, so it, I'd start with there's a whole range of sort of techniques that are that are really centered around infusing human expertise and knowledge into these models. And some of them in the examples you gave, which is sort of around safety and alignment and, and protecting the model from doing things you don't want it to do. Some of it is around just teaching it human preferences and behaviors. You need to remember how these models are trained. They're ingesting huge amounts of data, you know, they've basically gobbled up everything the internet can produce at this point. But there's a lot of human preferences and thinking and thought that isn't actually represented in language or knowledge or isn't actually embedded in the data. And let me just give you a very simple example. The difference between a uh, research paper that's written for a very specific audience in a very specific way relative to a news article, those obviously have very different structures and very different ways of communicating. And that's not really written down anywhere clear in terms of, hey, when you're communicating by text, this is sort of the norms of how you might want to communicate when you're communicating in a more formal setting. And so these are the types of things that are um, really come through through human training. So having people provide examples of these. And so that could be go provide, go have a nuclear physicist provide a model answer of how would you describe nuclear fusion. And the, these AI models are very good at extrapolating that and taking that and now learning how to exp explain other complicated topics through that. And so these are the different types of training. This could be finding you know gaps in the models where they might not be performing as well in terms of the correctness of the answer the clarity of those answers and so what you usually have is some sort of expert in a given domain and that could be a wide range of sort of subject areas from math to physics to economics uh, reviewing and engaging with these models they might be comparing different types of answers and saying I prefer this answer for this reason or I prefer this answer for this reason. This one has a factual error or this one has a clarity error. And that information is being used to retrain the model and basically bias it back towards 
more accurate and and higher quality answers. And so we do that across a whole variety of different uh, techniques. Is that helpful? Yeah. So like just to put a finer point on it, because this is so interesting to me. So like say I'm, you know, I'm an expert in FOMO and I write to it, ChatGPT, tell me how FOMO works. And it writes, and it writes a response that's like fine, but not amazing. Then I would write back to it. I would just be like, no, this is how it works, blah, 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 blah. And then it would ingest that information and refine its answer for the next time and the next time. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Even more so than that, it, it, that's obviously a very specific example, but what it should be also doing there is learning what it got wrong. Where uh, And so there's other concepts that it might have gone wrong in a similar way to getting FOMO wrong. And so what they're trying to do here is they're not able to correct every answer that GPT might possibly give. You know, that's obviously um, mm. an, an impossible task, but what it's trying to do is learn from its mistakes. And so this sort of reinforcement learning is what it's called, is actually giving it feedback and then it's taking that feedback and saying, okay, what else can I learn from this? How else can I apply this? And they're very good at taking relatively small amounts of data and then generalizing those across the whole model. So it's much less about getting your specific answer right and much more about how does it actually learn from whatever it got wrong there and generalize that across the model's performance. FOMO. FOMO. Now, obviously, you're doing something right because Invisible has broken 100 million in ARR, which for the uninitiated is annual recurring revenue, which means you're growing very quickly. Uh, what do you I mean? It's not easy to manage a kind of growth. Like I would sitting in your chair sounds intense. What do you have to get right in order to, to succeed at this point? What are the big kind of decisions and big focus areas for you? Yeah, that's right. And look, the, it's funny how growth rates are sort of all relative in some way. You know, the company has been growing very well for a long period of time, but last year really sort of accelerated. And that move from, say, doubling the business every year to quadrupling uh, really changes things. It sort of stress tests every part of the system in a lot of ways. It's really important to have a clear north star. You have so much coming at you, so much sort of change, so many things that need to be dealt with and fixed. It's it's important as both an individual, but also as a company to have a really clear north star around what is the most important thing. And for us, that really has been around collaborating and partnering with our clients. Those clients are some of the most demanding companies in the world. They continue to push us to get better and better in a whole variety of different ways and drive a lot of the innovation. But if we didn't have that, I think a lot of the ideas and concepts that have made Invisible what it is wouldn't have been generated. And so that staying on the front line, really being the first partner that companies call when they have a hard problem is the thing that's been the, the sort of first and foremost focus across the whole company. And then there's a couple of other things sort of underneath that. One is definitely getting the right team. You know, as the business grows that fast, you outgrow a lot of people. You know, the people that are very good at getting you from one phase to the next aren't necessarily the best people to take you through the next phase. And it's not necessarily that they're better or worse, just different people are, are better suited for different phases of company sort of growth and evolution. And so that's that's really important. The sort of hiring, getting the right people in the right positions, moving people around is absolutely critical when you're growing that fast. All right, Ben, one more question for you. Getting in the time machine, it's 2030 and you've achieved your objectives. What does Invisible look like at that point? And what does AI look like at that point? What's going on? Oh, what a great question. Um, I think, you know, I think probably most people would give you some answer about revenue or valuation or company size. And that's really not what drives us. You know, we've made a number of sort of fairly contrarian choices around how we want to build the business and what we're focused on. And sometimes those indicators lack. And so it's really important to be sort of focused on what really matters to you and, and how you're trying to grow the business. And to me, there's sort of two sides of that. One's more of an internally focused thing, which is what does this company 
sort of feel like, what type of company we're building. And we want to keep this small, tight, efficient in the same way that we're trying to push our clients to sort of stay lean and stay nimble. We want to do the same thing. We don't want to become this huge company with thousands and thousands of full-time employees that sort of create rigidity and structure. We want to stay very nimble and flexible. We want to build an amazing ecosystem of partners, advisors, alumni, entrepreneurs within this ecosystem that are helping you know build companies on top of the invisible platform is a really important part of, of how we're thinking about building that. And then going back to before around the culture, which is continuing to maintain really high standards, this really strong ownership mindset, a tight community of people that are building something together. These things are all really important to me. And if you look at as most companies grow, they sort of lose these things. And so really important to continue to fight for those things every day. Um, really want to continue to push this ownership mindset that's been so critical to our growth and success so far. And look, by that time, you know, we're probably on to our third or fourth generation of partners that have helped build this company, just looking at how we've sort of progressed over the last few years. And that, you know, creates a huge community of people that have, have helped build this company over a long period of time. From an external perspective, look, we're really trying to disrupt the services industry. When we look, there's really been very little innovation around how services companies have been built over the last few decades and see a real opportunity to both be a tech company and a service company and not see those as two ends of a spectrum, but really fuse them together in a really important way. So we want to bring that to the most important companies in the world, partner with them and bring them a really innovative capability that helps them run their businesses very differently. And so from an impact perspective, you really want to be working with them as strategic partners and really allow them to do things that they otherwise wouldn't be able to do. You know, in many ways, similar to how the cloud movement boomed a whole bunch of companies that probably couldn't exist without cloud computing. I think there's a future where there's a whole bunch of companies that don't exist, couldn't exist if they didn't have something like invisible technologies. All right. There you have it. I'll have you back in six years in March of 2020, 2030, <laughs> excuse me, to figure out how close we got. But until then, we've been with Ben Plummer, CEO of Invisible Technologies. If you want to learn more, check it out at invisible.co. We've been talking about AI, how to make it work for you. And with that, stop generating Pat GPT. FOMO. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMOSapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com.